Well, here we are. After hearing some very about some very interesting responses coming out of Comic-Con after they debuted this movie there, I went to go see the Fathom Events screening of The Killing Joke tonight. The soon to be starting tomorrow, I think, direct to video uh streaming on demand Batman animated movie that adapts Alan Moore's 1988, I believe, one-shot story, the, the Killing Joke. I'm probably going to have some mild spoilers in this video and try to keep it kind of brief. I probably won't, though, because there's some stuff I'm really probably going to get passionate about and get into with regards to this adaptation. But I want to save some of that for my video with Max uh, this weekend at Wizard World, because I'm sure he'll have stuff to say about it if he sees, if he went to a Fathom event or if he... Uh, rents it. There's gonna be stuff that we're gonna talk about and probably retread a lot of territory, but I just had to talk about certain things that really worked for me with this um, movie and things that I'm not upset about changes or alterations to the story or in this case ad additions to the story, but totally don't work. So let me tell you what, how this is going to break down. I'm going to critique kind of this 30-minute prologue that supplements this, this movie. Uh, it's, it feels very much like a completely separate adventure or episode of Batman. And then I'm going to get into the actual Killing Joke adaptation. It felt really weird. And I knew it was it was stuff that was, I knew it was going to happen early on. They were saying we're going to be adding extra story to this uh, feature because the original narrative wouldn't be able to support a feature length movie. Probably be about forty five minutes tops. And the Killing Joke segment of this does really feel like only about forty five minutes, maybe an hour. It doesn't really feel like this should have been a feature. But they said they were going to add in extra stuff to kind of, uh, I guess, portray Batgirl in, as more of a character in the narrative. Because in the original, this is getting into some mild spoilers here, I'm not going to give away details specifically, but in the original story by Alan Moore, Barbara Gordon is in it, Batgirl, her, her Batgirl identity isn't, but you know who the character is, and you, you know her connection to Batman and Bruce Wayne and so forth. And this isn't the most Batgirl-friendly story to begin with, so I was really curious what they were going to do to make me feel more sympathetic for this character than I already did going in. Because even in just that story, just having the context of who that character is and everything like that, and her connection to the Bat-universe, I already was like, Jesus. It, it's, it, it totally merits an R rating. This is a very uncomfortable story to begin with. So I was really curious what they were going to do to try and be like, well, how can we endear Barbara Gordon to you a little bit more before we do what we're going to do to her in this story? On its own, this, this prologue that focuses very heavily on Barbara's story, focuses very heavily on the Batgirl side of things. This could have worked in something else. This this story, this narrative, this journey that the character is going on in this first 30 minutes feels like it could have worked separately from this. It could have worked as its own thing. I'm, just off the top of my head, I was thinking that honestly this could have worked as a lead into a Birds of Prey feature. Like this could have been a segment of the story that has Barbara flashing back to when she was Batgirl, and this is kind of comes along the line as to why she stopped being Batgirl, along with what happens in the Killing Joke. But then you wouldn't have to reference directly the Killing Joke stuff; it, it would kind of only be hinted at, perhaps. But this opening thirty minutes—it's not bad. It it just feels really weird and out of place when you smush it into this unbelievably uncomfortable and dark Batman story and kind of makes it a little bit uh, more unsettling, honestly. The Batgirl side of this is very much focusing on her. It's focusing on she's in it for the adventure, she's in it for the thrill, she's in it because she does have this attraction to not just the, the danger but also to Batman himself and that at this point she had been working with him for a while. Kind of touches upon this 
point where she the, the character's at a crossroads. And the big thing that everyone got in a hoopla about at Comic-Con, I don't view as a big deal, honestly, coming from stuff like Batman the Animated Series, where, okay, spoilers here, the idea of some kind of intimacy between Batman and Batgirl isn't far flung for me because it's hinted at in stuff like Batman Beyond and things like that that Barbara and Bruce at one point did have some kind of relationship. You can see it in that series in when they came back to the animated series and kind of updated stuff and transitioned Dick Grayson out of there and brought in a new Robin and Batgirl became like a full-time uh, member of the team. You can you can get the hints of it in those episodes that there's some kind of spark between the two. There's some kind of connection there. So it doesn't feel wildly out of place for me when it's done in that fashion. When it's done right and when it's not put up against the killing joke. Because here, there there is a point. Batman and Batgirl do have a bit of a moment. A couple of things. <laughs> One, it starts off with him basically scolding her and grounding her like a father would to a daughter. So, kind of ew, number one. Number two, it starts out with that cliched, we start fighting and then we're gonna bang. You've seen it in other movies. 300, Rise of an Empire comes to mind. I'm sure it happened in one of the Sin Cities. This is where I was kind of feeling like, this is written by Brian Azzarello. The adaptation is written by Brian Azzarello. And part of me was thinking like, man, dude, you've been spending way too much time around Frank Miller. Because <laughs> this feels like a total Frank Miller scene. It's not as goddamn Batman-ish as Miller would write it, but I'm like, this reeks of recent Batman Miller stuff. Sorry, Frank, I still love you, but hey, you gotta tone it down, buddy. It really felt, whoa, where's this coming from all of a sudden? I mean, they had been kind of building it up and alluding to it here and there, but <laughs> it was inadvertently kind of hilarious, mainly because the, she's on top of him. They get to, like, embracing and kissing. She pulls off her mask and costume. The, don't worry, there's no, like, graphic, really graphic stuff here. But then before, you know, they pan out of them embracing up, 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 to this gargoyle, this goddamn gargoyle, leaning over a ledge and looking down like this. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't help it. I I let out a <laughs> in the theater. I felt so bad because that was the only noise. And the, the girl next to me kind of looked at me weird. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, it's funny. <laughs> Not because of the context of what they're doing, but just because that is the, the worst placement for a, a hilarious looking gargoyle and you had to pan to it you couldn't just do like a dissolve or something or or a fade to black you had to pan up to this goofy ass looking gargoyle leering down at this scene <laughs> um moving on to the actual context of this in the killing joke i'm sorry <laughs> it, it was such a funny visual I'm, i feel so i don't know why i feel so bad because because again this this story it could have worked elsewhere. You could have talked about this relationship tension thing between the two, talked about her struggles about being in his shadow essentially and crossing lines or, you know, being out of her element. And I do like when they do talk about these themes in this prologue essentially, but when all of a sudden it is brought some is transitions from that into killing joke. It is a jarring transition, and everything that you experience with this character before we get to the actual Joker segment of the movie feels completely done away with, for starters. I still enjoy the killing joke, I still enjoy the themes it addresses, and I I absolutely love the monologues and dialogues that both Batman and the Joker have in this. And that is the appeal of this, of this animated adaptation for me, is to be able to hear Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy, the voices of these characters that I have grown up just enjoying in every form of medium, from the animated series to uh, the Arkham games to other projects, that is going to be the appeal, is to hear Mark Hamill finally deliver his One Bad Day monologue, to hear Kevin Conroy um, deliver his we're both going to kill each other at some point monologue. You know, he's like, I came to talk monologue. To hear both of them, I did appreciate 
their interpretation, I guess, of the ending. Because it's something that's not made clear in the actual comic. Audio-wise, I'm like, okay, I can see which side of the debate of what happens in the end of the killing joke you guys are taking, just based off of the performance. And Kevin Conroy laughing is a very unsettling thing. So I'm appreciative of that stuff, definitely. But the fact that there's this 30-minute mini-adventure slapped into the front of it that really kind of is a disservice to the Batgirl character, honestly, because she goes through so much shit in this first 30 minutes, and I genuinely was like, Jesus, I've, no wonder she wants to quit. I feel bad about what she's going through, definitely. But then throw onto that what happens to her in The Killing Joke, and you're just like, <sighs> bleak. Like, more bleak than this story even was initially. I'm like, this is, this, they just, if, if, I know this wasn't the intent, but I'm like, it really feels like they don't like her, the writer or the creators. And again, I know that's not the intent. I knew they had to supplement the story with more stuff, and they felt like they were fleshing out her character a little bit more, and they do. But it just, this development for this character with this certain story feels just oddly placed, to say the least. It feels really kind of... It, they don't match up at all tonally. Uh, like I said, if it was for something like a Birds of Prey feature, it definitely would work. It, it, I feel that that arc for that character could work in something where she is more the focus, where she is one of the central characters. They do a, There is kind of a post credit scene, and they do a little cool send-up to her later identity in the Birds of Prey. So... That was kind of an uplifting note, and I feel like that was, it's like, after all the crap we put this character through, let's give her this, please. I, I was on board with that, but it, 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 didn't, it didn't gel well with what was the meat and potatoes of this movie, which is the, bat, the killing joke. The actual killing joke adaptation, it, it works. The killing joke, along with The Dark Knight Returns, was one of those stories that I always felt I didn't need to see an adaptation of that. Like, the book was enough for me. Here, The Killing Joke, th like I said, this adaptation's fine, but it's not adding anything new in the actual Joker segment of the story. It's not really taking it in vastly different places, aside from that ending where you kind of gather which side of the debate of what happens at the end the, the creators took. But again, the performances are fine. I've been wanting to hear Mark Hamill do this monologue for so many years. I, the fact that I do my own Mark Hamill impression in my one of my own uh, Great Moments in Geek video, which is down there somewhere, you can take a look. But yeah, that I do my own version of this monologue a la Mark Hamill because I'm such a big fan of his interpretation of the character, of his vocal uh, presentation for this character that, yeah, I, mean, I, I feel it was worth it to hear it. I feel it was worth it to hear him and Kevin Conroy working off each other again. I feel it was fun to hear Tara Strong as Batgirl again, definitely. Uh, the, one, the one performance in this that I really wasn't vibing with was Ray Wise as Commissioner Gordon. And, I mean, you know, I love Ray, Ra Ray Wise. Please don't kill me, Leland Palmer. I, I, lo I love the guy just fine. I enjoy him as an actor. He, vo vocal performance-wise, he just didn't feel right for this. And I feel it is part of my own being spoiled on Batman the Animated Series because when you've got Mark Hamill, Kevin Conroy, Tara Strong, all reunited, and they're playing the characters that they're well-known for playing, it feels weird not to have Bob Hastings there as Commissioner Gordon. Be and I, I know we can't help that. Bob Hastings, as far as I know, is dead. So <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. But Ray Wise's performance just felt a little too, a little too old manish for me. With Bob Hastings, his his delivery, you could get that. Yeah, this is an older gentleman, but his he he's he's stoic. He's solid, and that was something I felt was needed, especially in the Gordon kind of resolute moment in this story. And I just don't feel like Ray Wise really delivered on that front. He, he sounded a little too frail. Bob Hastings could do frail at times when he needed to, but he also could really deliver on powerful moments. You know what, Ray Wise, you did, you did what you could with it, but 
yeah, it's, it's just weird for me to hear all these voices from my childhood reconvening and having one essential one missing. I'm, I'm glad I got to hear Mark Hamill do the uh, Going Loony actual song to hear what it sounded like. It reminded me a lot of what he did in Arkham Knight when he had a singing number in that. And so that, that worked for me. I liked the music actually quite a bit. The music was really well done. There was a feature afterwards about the music that I'm sure is going to be on the DVD Blu-ray combo. So you can catch it there. The highlight for me actually was kind of the intro to the to the movie where there was this quick documentary about Mark Hamill and they interviewed him in London I'm guessing while he was on break for episode 8 and he was talking about you know starting in the business starting as Luke Skywalker starting about his audition for Batman and like his apprehension about taking on the Joker because he's like you can't have all-around good guy Luke Skywalker playing a villain like he didn't want the job but they said he was perfect for it the biggest enjoyment I got out of this was to see clips from Batman the Animated Series on a gigantic screen. That was kind of awesome. To see this show that I'd grown up watching and the show that I'd loved, it's like been this huge influence on, I mean, Jesus, look, it's been this huge influence on my art style and on my love for Batman, essentially, that to see clips of it up on the big screen was kind of a thrill to see that opening title sequence where he's knocking out those two uh, robbers on a rooftop. That was kind of awesome. As for the animation for this feature, it's okay. It's definitely that Warner's animation. You can feel that it is very much a direct-to-video. It'll look fine on the on your smaller screens. On the big screen, it, it wasn't really holding up as well as I was hoping it would. Certain action scenes, certain just character scenes where they're just talking or working off each other, they're not, they weren't as fluid or as dynamic as they would be had this movie been intended to be a big screen feature. That's the thing, is that you can tell wholeheartedly that the crew was making a DTV because it wasn't until later that they decided to make it a Fathom event when they got so much publicity and press surrounding it. They're like, well, let's make it R, let's make it a Fathom event. And they earned their R rating, too. I mean, there's no really... I mean, there's harsh language in it, but the biggest derogatory term I heard in it was... One of the gangsters calls Batgirl a bitch. It's always weird to hear someone say friggin' instead of fucking or something like that. <laughs> Especially when it's a hardened criminal, because I'm like, there's no way a hardened criminal would say friggin'. <laughs> but that's my own thing. Yeah, but the animation itself, I'm sure is going to look fine on, on home video. Just on the big screen, and I was like up in the second row too, on the big screen it, it w didn't look as astonishing as probably if I was further back or if I was watching this at home. But otherwise, it's not terrible animation. I mean, there, there's some cool action stuff. The Joker's stuff is funny. His final joke at the end of the movie is got, a, got quite a few laughs from, from the audience. Again, I feel bad for having that very out-of-nowhere laugh because of that damn gargoyle. <laughs> it's a funny visual sticking out of my head, I'm sorry. The feature itself is fine. It's just, yeah, I, I just can't get over the fact that the, supplement, the, the extra material they put in to bring it to feature length does feel wildly out of place with the actual narrative. I'm not say, and I'm not saying that that, that that narrative in and of itself is bad or a detriment to characters or anything like that. In a, in a, in a different context, like I said, in something else that wasn't the killing joke, that would have been perfectly fine. But when it brings up these... these kind of more risque ideas and more adult themes into a story that is already pretty fucking adult and bleak and everyone talks about well what did the Joker actually do to her I've never I've never read into what some people read into with his actions in the original story I view it more as he's he's just degraded and sick and he's it's more about the humiliation it's not about any gratification on his part so i've never read more into that than i needed to i think i'm okay <laughs> about that but this having that extra stuff incorporated into the story definitely doesn't 
do Batgirl any favors in this movie. So what I'd recommend doing is you kind of view them separately. And you'll know when the when the break is coming because there is a fade out and fade in and Batgirl's narration definitely says like when when her stuff's over and the actual killing joke begins. So you're not going to be missing out on much if you just treat them separately. Treat the prologue as its own thing as like an extra episode of Batman the Animated Series. Sure. But like the actual killing joke stuff, if you want to view that on its own, like, yeah, I'd probably skip a half hour and then start there. I mean, that's all I gotta say. I can't wait to hear what Max has to say about this, and we'll probably get into more in-depth stuff, I'm sure. I don't know. I can't gauge his reaction about stuff like this. He might he might be fine with it, or he might be pissed. It's gonna it's gonna be an interesting conversation. And uh, hopefully we'll have that up for you this weekend when he and I uh, convene with all the Three Geeks guys over at Wizard World. If, you, if you're a fan of Warner Brothers Animation, if you're a fan of this story, it is a cool addition. It's not going to top the original story b by any means, but if you just want to hear Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy, you know, handle this dialogue and handle these monologues, definitely you should check it out. It's just, again these two combating narratives really feel like they should be their own separate things. Um, so there we have it. Uh, see you guys later.